Okay, welcome back to American National Government. Summer 2021 students, you are getting me in real time. I had to uh, re-record because the information obviously changed from the last time I presented this unit. So the presidency. Most of you know what we covered in uh, the Road to the White House campaigning and elections, that unit, is, um, I mean, part of this as well. But that is the sitting president, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., former vice president, former senator from Delaware. I, I don't know that he ever held a job outside of government. Um, he assumed office on January 20th, 2021, at 12.01 p.m., as per the law requires. It used to be March. You learned about that in the Supreme Court unit. And he ran with Kamala Harris, who was the junior senator from California until she was elected with him. So what we didn't cover in the campaigning and elections unit the president all has all executive power. Now, the president has, as I said, all executive power. Congress has all legislative power. The court, meaning the Supreme Court, but the courts, supreme and lower, have all judicial power. Um, so the president can conduct foreign affairs. The president can make treaties. The president is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Um, now obviously, there are checks and balances, as there are with the other two branches that prevent this from, you know, becoming, uh, let's just say, problematic. But there he is, the chief executive of the nation, and he has a four-year term, which is renewable once, so he can serve up to eight years. But when I ask you on the test... How long does a president's term last? Well, the correct answer is four years. Now, in theory, a president could serve up to 10 years. And this would be a situation, that would, a highly improbable situation. But if a president dies after the midterm elections, by whatever means, uh, and the vice president takes over, the vice president can run again and then run again after that. So four, eight, nine, ten. Now, will that ever happen? I, I sincerely hope not, but that is uh, a possibility. So electors... <laughs> members of the Electoral College, in other words. They can't be U.S. Senators, they can't be U.S. Representatives, Cabinet Officials, Supreme Court Justices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Constitution says, which is where I'm getting most of this from, any person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States. All right. And this is just, I, I threw this in because this was a, just a misconception uh, that I found students had. The president and the vice president, they can come from the same state. So if Kamala Harris came from Delaware, that would have been absolutely fine. Now, the problem is the electoral math there. Electors are prohibited from casting votes for candidates from the same state twice, meaning they could, Biden could get Delaware's three electoral votes or Kamala Harris, not both. And that comes into play during close elections. Now, this last election, electorally speaking, wasn't particularly close. So it probably wouldn't have been a problem. But that is the way the system works, when it works. So there is an oath of office that the president must take, according to the Constitution. This, this little book that I've been slowly walking you through. 
Uh, before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. He doesn't say that. He's not president. And that's timed pretty well to coincide with 1201 when there is. So we always have a president, that is. So if you want to watch Biden get sworn in, there is the link. That is a good link. The president is, of course, compensated. The president shall at stated times, and this is just all in here. Receive for his services a compensation which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected, and he shall not receive within that period any other emolument from the United States or any of them. So he has to be president. He can't be representative so-and-so from the great state of Illinois as well as president of the United States. He can't be taking money from... Uh, you know, the, the Department of Justice to advocate its interests in the White House. I mean, what, whatever situation you want to come up with, he just, he must be president. He must be in the White House. He can't have an increase or diminishment in pay. Um, and that's that. So the president makes $400,000 a year and he gets a $50,000 expense account which would be really nice. A <laughs> uh, $100,000 travel account. I'm assuming that that is probably for like renting hotel rooms and stuff like that because it would cost more than $100,000 to fire up Air Force One. And he has $19,000 allotted for entertainment. Now, when what he doesn't use at the end of the year goes back to the Treasury as per 3 U.S. Code 102. So uh, it's a lucrative gig if you can get it. So <laughs> at the end of their term or terms, uh, the president is still on the government payroll. And this wasn't always the case. This is a uh, Harry Truman thing. Uh, he left office and went back to Independence, Missouri, and he was, uh, you know, a senior citizen by the time that happened. He got a visit from a congressional delegation seeking advice on, I used to, this it escapes my mind, but some matter anyway, and they saw that he was living in absolute, I mean, poverty. Not good conditions at all. So they thought to themselves, is this how a former chief executive ought to live? Uh, no. So the presidential pension was born out of that. Now, do these guys need it? Probably not today with the book tours and the lecture circuits and everything else. I think they probably could do a decent job making a living on their own. They get health care. And I don't know why that says about. It is $200,000. He has a pension of $200,000. He has health care. And this is health care that we could only dream about, folks. Um, it's the, definitely the Cadillac plan. I mean, it's not quite as good as what an incumbent president has, but it's pretty good. Uh, paid official travel. Uh, what always comes to mind is, is I think, when, when was it? The Obama administration, uh, President Obama sent President Clinton to North Korea to uh, collect some recently freed journalists. He took Air Force One. Uh, the, we, we foot the bill for that. But presidents who have left office are kind of seen as senior statesmen, so they might be sent uh, to such and such a place, you know, to advocate the interests of the United States. 
and they get in office too. Uh, it's sometimes, but not always, appended to the library. And the library is something that they have to privately fundraise for. That doesn't come out of any sort of government uh, account. So the office, the office though does. So then we come to the matter of presidential succession. So this is who takes over in case of a presidential incapacity of whatever kind. And, and um, it, 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 it ranges in, in seriousness, like uh, George W. Bush, I mean, towards the end of his presidency, had a surgery or two uh, where he was under general anesthesia for a few hours, and uh, Dick Cheney was the acting president. So, I mean, it, it could, you know, this comes into play if, if, if for any number of reasons. So if Dick Cheney happened to be president, then at that time, then the Speaker of the House would have had to have become acting president in case Dick Cheney needed a surgery. But the succession. So in case of the removal of the president from office or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall, shall devolve on the vice president. And the Congress may be may by law provide for the case of removal, death, resignation, or inability, both of the president and vice president, declaring what officer shall then act as president, and such officer shall act accordingly until the disability be removed or a president shall be elected. So this was taken care of when it was decided that cabinet officers would be next in the line of succession to the executive branch. So the succession, you have the vice president, Kamala Harris would come first. Then the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, she has to, though, resign from Congress before she would become president in this in a hypothetical situation. Uh, because, again, it is illegal to work for two branches of the federal government at the same time. And the president pro tem of the Senate, the president pro tem is... Uh, as I explained in the, the Congress unit, the probably one of the most senior, uh, probably one of the oldest, uh, curmudgeonly uh, senators from the majority party acts as the president pro tem. The current one's name is Patrick Leahy, and he has been the senator from Vermont since well before probably your parents were born. Yeah, I just paused to look him up. He's been the senator from Vermont since 1975, 81 years of age. Uh, then the Secretary of State, and that's provided by law. You go through all the cabinet secretaries in the order that their departments were created, not necessarily in the order that makes the most sense because you have, of course, you have state treasury defense but then you have um agriculture the interior you know transportation before you get to the secretary of homeland security which was a george w bush invention and yeah the secretary of homeland security is the last in the line of succession and if we ever get there, we're, we'll have bigger problems than who the president is. So I'd encourage you to watch this. I can't play it because YouTube would copyright claim me. But this link is good. I'd encourage you to give this a watch. It's about three minutes. And we'll pick up with the designated survivor in just a second. <laughs> 